Hello and welcome to this video lecture where I'm going to talk through uh, something called task centered practice. Now task centered practice is probably the most um, the most widely claimed model of social work practice used within the United Kingdom. So if you're out on placement as a student social worker and you ask social workers what models do you use, what theories do you use, um, task centered practice is probably going to be one of the most commonly ones, most commonly uh, given answers to that particular question. Um, what I'll start by saying though is that uh, although I think it's often claimed, I think there is a bit of a problem with this in the fact that, uh, to use the words from uh, Play Hamlet, it, it's a custom more honoured in the breach than the observance. And what I mean by that is that a lot of times when someone tells you that they are doing task-centred practice, uh, they often aren't actually doing task-centred practice for reasons that may become clear as we work through the video. What I would like to say about task centered practice though is it is one of the very few models that really originates within social work practice. This came from social workers looking at what they did and really it comes from two uh, key building blocks of good social work practice which is uh, the fact that as an approach it is outcomes driven so it's very much focused about what are you trying to achieve? And secondly, it's about, it's partnership based. So it's about working with people uh, in partnership. I mentioned the fact there's this problem that task centered practice is widely claimed, but often uh, what you see in practice is not quite the same as uh, the claim that's made for it. And I think there's a real key uh, reason for this, there's a real key problem with it, which is the fact that um, when you start looking at what task centered practice is, you find this massive sort of divergence of what it is. So that when you look at Marsh and Dole 2005, uh, they talk about task centered practice having 13 elements. If you look in Parker and Bradley 2010, they talk about task centered practice having five core stages. Uh, Wilson et al. 2011, in what they write about task centered practice, say there are seven stages. Uh, Marsh, 2007, uh, he writes about there being five elements. And Coolshed and Orm, 2012, talk about five phases. So you get this kind of phases, elements, stages. Are there five of them? Are there seven of them? Are there 13 of them? So it's no wonder that it's a little bit kind of confusing about what task centered practice is. Um, so what I'm going to do in this video uh, is to start to unpick and unpack uh, what task centered practice is and to do that using the practice pyramid. Um, so I'm going to talk about the practice pyramid and we're going to start with the idea of values and beliefs. So uh, there are a number of core uh, values and beliefs here. Um, the first of which is the fact that task centered practice is very much based on the belief that the worker is a facilitator or a guide of change and not really an expert. So task centered practice is very much a non-expert model where you are facilitating and guiding the person in coming up with their own solutions. A uh, second core value and belief in, in task centre practice is that people already have skills, strengths, resources, solutions, and that you can build on those. So that's a second uh, core belief. Third core belief is that people basically construct uh, problems and they construct goals and solutions in a very personal way. Though there's not um, necessarily a clear uh, preset idea about what things should be like. That's up to the worker to negotiate with each individual. Um, another kind of core set of values and beliefs is the idea of uh, worker optimism and respect. So good task centre practice is a very respectful form of practice and it's one that very much is built on the idea that change is possible and change is a good thing. 
Uh, and then finally, uh, in terms of beliefs in Tata Seneca practice, it is uh, this quite strong belief that um, the time limits that actually specifying that a work will last work will last a certain amount of time helps keep things focused. That actually, when people are working towards an end point, they work better than when things are open ended. And if you look at the history of Tata Seneca practice, you can see very much where that came from. So let's move up now and talk a bit about uh, the more kind of uh, qualities and attributes of a good uh, task-centred worker. Um, and there's a real mix of these. So, I mean, things like respect for individuals, about empathy, about a, a sort of a resilient humility, so a sense that you know, you don't really think you're an expert, you don't think you're anything particularly special, but you have expertise, you can draw that on that to help people. Uh, this idea that I mentioned a second ago about quiet optimism, so not a kind of loud enthusiasm, but a quiet optimism that believes, yeah, you can get there in the end, we can do this together. Um, an emotional resilience, an ability to deal with setbacks, an ability to listen to people's stories, um, curiosity, creativity, honesty and integrity, warmth, sense of playfulness, sense of fun, sense of humour maybe, uh, compassion, that kind of links in with empathy and ability to really care about people, certain amount of courage, a willingness to take risks, a willingness to try new things, um, and then an assertiveness in all this, you know, you need to be kind of assertive to keep your focus, to keep the task centred, to keep your mind centred on the task without losing all that person-centred values. And then there's, there's really a host of other uh, qualities and attributes that are important in making task-centred practice work. Then we want to talk about the relationship. What kind of relationship? do you form in task-centred practice? Well, it's clear, it's focused, it's professional. Uh, you're there to do a job. You're not there to be somebody's friend. You're there to help get a job done. But it's collaborative, it's honest, it's respectful. It's about partnership working. I mentioned that earlier. The relationship is also time-limited and outcome-focused. So you're actually focusing on you're only going to be in this relationship for a very short amount of time in order to achieve very specific goals. Um, it's based on empathy, being empathic towards uh, the person, understanding their experience, understanding their view of the problems and of the goals. And really it aims for an equality and a mutuality in the relationship, a kind of sense of equal partners. Now, for lots of reasons, that's not always possible. Um, arguably, it's never possible. Um, but what you can do is you can you can try and get the gap between your power and service use of power down to a minimum so that you are working more or less in partnership in a mutual, equal way. So then let's talk a little bit about theories. I think it's fair to say that task centred practice, when done well, is very person-centred. Uh, again, it tends to be ecological and systemic. It takes, tends to take into account a person's environment, the, the needs and the resources and the challenges and the benefits of the systems in which the person is living, working, operating. It aims to be anti-oppressive. It aims to deal with the injustices of society and to recognise that people face um, oppression on grounds of gender, age, ethnicity, sexuality, ability, class, um, and it aims to address that, to tackle it directly. Um, it's very much an evidence-based, draws on very much an evidence-based theory. The idea that, you know, prove this works, show us that you're making a difference, let's have a look at the evidence. And then finally, it is eclectic and integrative. Now, um, eclectic means it draws on a wide range of different theories. So actually there's a whole kind of host of other theories that underpin uh, the different tasks that you're going to choose. Um, I don't really like eclectic because I think eclectic is a bit of a mess. It's, it's a bit of this and a bit of that with no real central core to it. 
think I much prefer the idea of being integrative, where you try and integrate different theories into something that will fit this particular person. And remember this thing that I've said before about, you know, your job is to make the theory fit the person, not to make the person fit the theory. So you're trying to get the theory to fit the person. Um, you know, so you're not telling people what they should be, you're using theory to understand the way things are and how to change them. Um, and then we move on to that kind of final bit, which is the skills. And really, in good task-centered practice, and in good uh, social work practice generally, I mean, you know, your core skills are your communication skills, so your uh, listening skills, your uh, questioning skills, your interviewing skills. Uh, your kind of verbal interventions that you make. It's your relationship building skills, it's your ability to uh, develop a trusting relationship, to steer that relationship through the challenges of um, working together, uh, healing the relationship when it goes wrong, because it often does, and then ending the relationship when the work is done. And then obviously there's this whole kind of raft of problem solving skills. Uh, that are really important, and uh, you know I can't emphasise that enough. That the, the the more solidly you build your creative problem solving toolbox, um, the more effectively you're going to be able to work. And then finally, there's the kind of reflective practice skills, which uh, includes your ability to understand what's working, what's not working, why, to manage yourself, to manage your time, to uh, assertively build relationships in a positive constructive way. Um, now that's kind of set in the scene. So I said much earlier on in this video that uh, you've got all these different kind of models and that a lot of time when people say they're doing so, uh, doing task centers practice they're not. So let's talk about what I personally would say is the minimum standards for something to be classed as task centered practice. So really, if something was task centre practice, I would expect to see in some combination or in some format, these nine key activities. Mm. Number one, I would expect to see the creation of a clear shared mandate. What gives you the right to, to intervene in someone's life? Why are you there? Um, quite often that's uh, because people have asked you to be there. So it's very much consent. Sometimes it's because you have a duty to be there. So in kind of certain mental health settings, in certain job perception settings, you have a duty to be there. You need to establish that mandate about what gives you the right to try and help this person um, use ta a task-centered approach to solve their problems. Second thing I would expect to see would be the development of a collaborative relationship. One that's actually about equality, that's about sharing, that's about mutuality, that's not you telling. If you're giving somebody tasks to do, if you're telling people what to do, that's not task-centered practice. But if you've built a collaborative relationship where you're sharing ideas together, then that possibly is. Third one, and really this is this is probably the one that gets missed out the most, is, is setting clear timescales. So for it to be called task-centered practice, there needs to be an idea of how long this work will last. Fourth thing that I would expect to see is a thorough exploration of problems. So not necessarily a simple, straightforward uh, deal with the presenting problem, what's the most obvious problem, to actually spend a bit of time getting to know well, what's really going on here. What's the key problem that we need to work on? The fifth thing I would expect to see would be a targeting of problems. So. You can't solve everything. So what are you going to prioritise as your main problems to work on? Sixth thing I would expect to see is having established what the target problems are to create goals. So what do you want things to be like? What are you aiming for? What's the outcome? I said at the beginning, this is very much an outcomes driven approach. So what is the outcome you're aiming for? What is your goal? Seventh thing I'd expect you to look for is the development and selection of tasks. So working out who is going to do what, and in particular, an emphasis on the person you are working with being the most more active participant in the tasks. So task-centered practice is not about you doing tasks for service user, it's about you helping the service user develop tasks they can do for themselves. 
So the eighth thing is about the monitoring and refining of outcomes. So it's about the kind of exactly how do you want things to be? What's working and to some extent refining of tasks as well. So working out how to do the task better. Um, and then finally, for it to be task centre practice, I would expect to see a clear end date. So that's very much what I'd be expecting to see if we're talking about task centre practice. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to leave you this thing from Lindsay, which uh, Lindsay 2010 uh, has this definition of task centre practice as being practice where there's an emphasis on time limited, focused intervention where tasks are clearly defined, problems are prioritised, clients are encouraged to build their capacity and confidence by achieving agreed goals. So it's very much this kind of step, 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 achieve your first goal, achieve your second goal, achieve your third goal. Um, and this again is you can see where the richness of the theory comes in because this is very much linked to uh, things like um, Bandura's idea of self-efficacy. That when people believe that something will work, and when they believe that they can get it to work, uh, then they will achieve it. So that's just an overview uh, using uh, the practice pyramid of the feel for what task centre practice is.